part where he talks about our country. He said, this is my country. This is the country I know. This is the people that I love, no matter what, what race you are, what people you are. He said, we're coming together. And he made this statement, love is doing what's best for someone else without regard for yourself. It's the best thing you'll ever do for yourself. Nothing will fix hurt like loving other people. And those words just, I watched it over and over again. And I thought, man, he just spoke right straight from the spirit and the heart of God right there. But what I see here is I see people, a tragedy that's brought people to come together. The love of God, you even heard people saying, I've been praying and praying for people. The love of God is still in our nation. We are a nation under God. And so what I'm seeing right now is, guys, we are at the end times. We are on the brink of some things getting ready to happen. We are just on the what is it, cusp of things that are getting ready to take place. And we have got to wake up to what our part is and what part position we're supposed to be. Are we ready if something were to happen here in Austin like this? Are we ready to take in a bunch of people and minister and share the love of Jesus and show them the love of God and tell them about redemption in Christ? Are we ready for the floodgates to open and for sinners to come in and want to give their lives? Are we so occupied with our own lives and what we're doing in and of ourselves that we can't see beyond what God's called us to be here for? Amen? And, you know, I I had such a a burning with this in my heart yesterday yesterday or Friday when we prayed, and the spirit of intercession hit us while we were praying, and and it was for the people. And I believe the Holy Ghost told me last week that God's going to turn this thing around, and there's going to be some greater things that happen in the end. You know what's greater than anything, any, any natural or materialistic thing for these people to get their material things back? Is somebody to get their hearts saved and their lives to be one so that in, in the end, eternally, they'll go to heaven and they'll not burn in hell. That's the ultimate thing here. That's the ultimate prize for all that's taking place right now. And unfortunately, sometimes it takes disasters and catastrophes for people to turn their eyes back to Jesus. And you see that's what's taking place right now. People are turning their eyes to God. They're turning their eyes to each other. How can I help? The race issue is is down. Nobody's thinking about any of that garbage anymore. People are out there helping each other, lifting each other up, praying. I know people in Texas are praying all over for all these people that have been affected. Our hearts are moved. Jesus was moved with compassion. We need to be moved with compassion for souls in this hour. How many have ever heard of Dr. Lester Sumrall? He was um, he was sick with tuberculosis to the age of 17, and he was on his way out, and God gave him a vision of a, of a coffin uh, and a Bible, and he said, you choose. You either preach or you die. And he said, I'm going to preach. And the next day he got up, and he'd been bleeding and bleeding. He got up. He was 100 pounds, and the Lord healed him. And his dad was not a, a good man. He beat him. He said, you're going to do what I tell you to do. He said, i got to do what God's called me to do. So he left home at 17. A year, year and a half later, he was speaking in Tennessee somewhere in worship, and he, had a, a, like a, he went into an open vision or a trance, as the Bible calls it. And his eyes were opened, and he saw some things, and, and God showed him a road. It was called the road to life the road of life and he saw these people walking and he saw an exit ramp and all uh, several people were going off this exit ramp and he said god and then he saw some other people over at the edge and they were all they were all falling and they were cursing god and they were ripping their their flesh and they were screaming and crying for help and and god and uh lester summerall said god what is this and he said the exit ramp are the people whose lives have been redeemed and restored because of the blood of jesus the righteous they're going on but those those that are over there, those are the ones who have never heard, who've never gotten saved, who've never asked Jesus in their life, and their blood will be on your hands. He said, why? I haven't done anything to them. I'm doing what you told me to do. And he gave him the scripture in Ezekiel where it talks about if you don't speak and show people the way, their blood will be on your hands. And I'm telling you right now, I believe that we have a great commission as Jesus gave us right before he went up to to heaven. And he told us, go into all the world 
and make disciples. He didn't say go and just get somebody saved and then leave and go do your own thing. He said go and make disciples. What is a disciple? A disciple is somebody who's disciplined to follow after Christ. There's a whole lot of folks that are saved, but they're not disciples. They're not following after the way of Christ. You can be saved and not follow after the way of Christ. If you read your Bible, there's a whole lot of stuff in there where Jesus said, you got to do this and you can't do this. You got to do this and you can't do this. It's called holiness. I know it's something of the old time past, but let me tell you what, it's here and it's now. We got to live holy and righteous before God and we got to get our minds on why we're here. We got to get our minds on who we're serving and who's we belo- who we belong to. We're no longer our, we're no longer our, we're no longer responsible for ourselves. We've given our lives over to Christ. We've lost our life in him. We're carrying the cross of Christ and we're sharing the love of Jesus with people because I'm telling you what, time is short. Time is short, y'all. Let's look at Luke 6:46. I know this is really um I don't mean to kind of be blasting in your face, but it's really burning in my heart right now. In fact, I was praying that I'd be able to get through it without crying because my heart is really heavy for people. If you can see these people right now that are on this video and how their lives have been changed and affected, let me just tell you, one thing can change our world here today. One thing like this, you can, just the gas thing right now, people are freaked out, and I know there's a, that's a whole side issue, but just think about the fear that's come in. People are thinking, oh, well, what if we didn't have gas? We wouldn't be able to go to work. We wouldn't be able to go to school. We wouldn't be able to get the, the food supplies that we need in. We would be without. What happens when you're without? All we have is Jesus. You can't go anywhere or do anything. You can't get money. What do we got left? Jesus. And there is promise to us that he will be our supply. He will be our provider supernaturally. He provided bread, manna, supernaturally in the desert. Don't you think he can provide for you supernaturally? You better start getting supernaturally minded because I'm telling you what, we're coming in the day and the hour when we have to be supernaturally minded because we've got to call on those things that are in the spirit to provide for us now in this hour. Amen. Get used to it right now. You need a touch in your body. Start drawing from the spirit right now. Start drawing from the resources that are available to you already. It's already ours in Christ. Go ahead and receive what you need now. Don't wait till the tragedy hits and say, oh, I think I remember Pastor Steve talking about this. I think I need to do this and I need to do this. No, it's already yours in Christ. You just receive it right now by faith. Amen? Get into practice of receiving things by faith right now because there's going to come a day when that's all you got. What happens when it's all you got? Hmm, you better have it. It's like the, like the ten virgins. They, they were told to be ready. It's an illustration of the church. Five came. The Word of God says they came with oil in their lamps. The other five didn't come. And they, when they realized he was knocking at the door at midnight, midnight is significant because we don't know the hour. It could be any time. And, and when the five who didn't have oil for their lamps came, they said, give us some oil. And they, the other five says, no, you go get your own oil. And Jesus comes and he shuts the door on the other five and says, I never knew you. Do you know what that lamp is representative of? It's representing your faith. Do you know what that oil is inside? It's the love of God. Your faith works by love. If you don't have any love, then your faith is not working. And if we're going to be ready for what the kingdom of heaven is providing for us, if we're ready for Jesus' return, then we've got to have some love operating in our faith or our faith working by love. Amen? So we need to stir ourselves up. If you don't feel love for others and say, God, help me. Help me to have compassion for others. Help me to to change my view. Help me to look at what's most important in your sight, in your eyes, God. Luke 6, 46. Do you have that up? But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? We're calling him Lord, and he's saying, you're not doing what I've said. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. 
He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. You see, these folks have just dealt with a natural flooding in their lives. Everything's been destroyed. Everything's been uprooted. But I'm going to tell you what. Those, those floods and those storms are representative of circumstances in your life, things that happen, bodily things, emotional things, relational things, job things, losses, deaths, whatever it is. Those are all representing, the storms are representing those things that happen in our lives. And if we'll build our foundation on Jesus... When those storms come, our roots are deep. Our foundation is deep and nothing can move us. If every storm moves us, then how can we help anybody? How can we help anybody if our tree is tossed over every time we get some silly little thing that comes up? We had an opportunity last week for this to happen to us. I won't tell you what it was. (laughs) It was a financial issue. And as soon as it came, the initial feeling is, Oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? Sat down on the couch, and I said, God, in the name of Jesus, we just call it in right now. We thank you, Father, that you're our source, you're our provider. We agreed together right there in that moment. We realized we got to call it in. We're tithers, we're givers. We have grounds, we have rights, so we call it in. It's our covenant right with you. And the next day, somebody called and said, I want to help you with that. The next day. I didn't e- we didn't even have to think about it again. Praise God. And, you know, it was something that we needed to, to deal with, but it was one of those things you keep putting off because the supply seemingly isn't there, you know, and you keep thinking, oh, I'll get to it, and eventually. But God, he is so awesome. He makes a way where it seems like there is no way. Even in the midst of our issues, he's like, here, let me just give you some mercy. Let me just give you some grace. Here, go, here you go. It's just a matter of us calling on him. We don't, we don't call enough. <laughs> Amen? Ask. Seek. You'll find. My little Braden, he was wanting me to help him do something the other day. He was in the living room, and I was in the kitchen, and he said, uh, Mom, will you open my gummy bears or whatever it was? And I said, okay, I will. And he said, well, will you open my gummy bears from over the couch? And I said, okay, I will. And he said, We opened my gummy bears, and I said, come unto me. I'm not coming to you. You come unto me, and I will open your gummy bears. And right then, the Holy Spirit said, that's the way it is. People want something from me, but they don't want to come unto me and get in the presence and get close and get hooked up with what he's wanting to do in your life. Amen? Get close. Get hooked up. There's too much stuff occupying. There's scripture in Isaiah where it talks about you're drinking from the cup of this life and you're intoxicated with this life stuff. And we're going to get into this. So he says those who he heard, he heard, did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently. So we've got to build our foundation on Jesus That's why, let me just tell you something. We've been um, in contact with some folks who've just gone through a huge tragedy in their life. And I I, I encourage them, don't look to yourself. Don't look to victim mentality. Don't look at anger. Don't look at bitterness. you got to look to Jesus. In the middle of this turmoil, of this mess, of this seemingly despairing moment, you got to get your eyes on Jesus. What did Jesus do when he was on the cross? He looked away from the shame to us, to that what was set before him to endure the cross. He looked to us. He said, oh, there's victory on the other side of this cross. I'm going to look away from the shame. I'm going to look away from the pain. I'm going to look away. I'm going to look to the reward on the other side. In the midst of your despair, in the midst of, of receiving, believing for a manifestation of receiving something in your life, I don't know, maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's, I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, you look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, and you put him first, and you put his kingdom first, his kingdom, and we're going to talk about what his kingdom really is. I think a lot of folks have a little bit confused about what the kingdom of heaven is. We're going to talk about it. Praise God. Let's look at um, Matthew sixteen twenty four. 
Someone who's committed to Christ understands how to walk in the fullness of the Spirit and is going to influence and help produce the same kind of Christian followers. Just like a good coach, I know some of y'all have been involved in athletics. Good coach comes in and says, uh, these are the rules, these are the regulations, you do this well, we'll be a team and we'll win. Right? The military has rules and regulations. There's, there's things that you have to live by. And they come in and they say, you got to do this and this, and when you get out on the battlefield, it's going to save your life. If you don't do it, you either die or you get court-martialed and put in prison. Because you got to do it the way the way of the commander in chief says to do it. It's the same way with the kingdom of heaven. He's given us a great commission. He's given us some boundaries. He's given us some. He set forth some things that he's asked us to do, and we do it his way, and we'll live victoriously. We'll see victory on the other side. We'll see reward. I know it's hard for us to wrap our minds around, you know, crowns and and gold streets and mansions and all that stuff, and it sounds really great, but we don't quite understand it. I believe we'll get up there and we'll continue to learn. We'll continue to teach. There'll be all kinds of things that's going to take place. We're going to live life. We're not just going to sit around the throne. I know that's a part of it. We'll worship, but we're going to live. Let me tell you something. What we're doing here. This isn't a part of my life. It is my life. You being a Christian is not a part. You coming to church is not a part of your life. It's not a priority in your list. It is your life. It's your connection. It's your focus. It's your life. It's your resource. It's your protection. It's your protection. I know lots of folks that have not been under a covering, uh, under a pastor, under a church covering, and the enemy has come in to steal, kill, and destroy. We've got to yield ourselves to the way of of Christ, the way God has ordained. He's got order. He's a God of order. He set things in order for us to do it his way. If we'll do it his way, when a team does things the way that the athletic director has said, man, it's an all-win-win situation. It's powerful. It's exciting to watch. I hear my husband up there yelling and screaming at him. Yes, you know, guys, come on. Or, Or the military, the same way. We win if we do it God's way. Amen? Matthew 16, 24 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to to his works. This is what we've been given to do, the works of Jesus. I must work the works of Jesus while it is day. While it is day. It's day right now, but we're coming into the nighttime. What are the works of Jesus? It's the Great Commission. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. That's what we're doing here. You know what the purpose is for the church? We come here not just out of um, obligation. We come here not just out of feeling like, well, I got this is my Christian duty. We come here, first of all, to worship God because we love him. And secondly, the, the duty of the church and of the pastors, the leadership in the church, is to exhort and encourage and to build up, edify the body of Christ so that you'll go out, we'll go out, all of us, I'm preaching to the choir, we'll go out and be disciples and bring in more disciples, and bring in more disciples. I see all these folks that have been affected by this storm, and I'm thinking, God, this is a time for harvest. This is a time. These people need Jesus right now, and they're desperate, and they don't have any stuff to run home to. They don't have a TV to sit in front of for hours and hours. They don't have anything else occupying their time. They don't even have jobs right now because a lot of them, their jobs have been washed out. Their banks have been washed out. Their grocery stores, everything has been washed out. What do you do? You call out to God. And I'm telling you, in the blink of an eye, it can be like that for us here. We can lose our jobs. We can lose our gas. We can lose our grocery stores. We can lose everything. And what do we have left? The Great Commission, Jesus. We have got to burn with this, y'all. We've got to burn with this right now because our time is short. Let me tell you what the kingdom of God isn't about. Well, partially, but that's not the focus. 
A lot of folks think, well, the kingdom of heaven is me seeking my relationship with God. It's me and Jesus. Uh, it's just me. That's my relationship. The kingdom of heaven is all about. No, the kingdom of heaven is about souls. It's the heartbeat of God. Your relationship is just, that's the initial part of you becoming saved and, and giving your life to Jesus. But then he gives you a commission to do something with it, like he did the disciples. He, he shared the love of, of God to them, and they were changed. And they said, what more can we do? And then he says, I want you to go and tell others about the good news. And I want you to get other people saved and, and disciple them so that they'll go and tell others. And it just keeps multiplying. God's not about adding. He's about multiplicity. And right now, we should be completely full having two or three services at a time because he is about multiplicity. The fruit, the fruit is evidence of where we, our minds are right now. And if we need help with it, let's ask the helper. If we don't have an urging for it, if we don't have a desire, if our desire is all about me, myself, and I, then say, God, give me the desire. I repent. I ask you to help me with this. I'm not speaking to any one person. I'm speaking to all of us because the Holy Ghost spoke this to me, to me. And I feel like I've been corrected. And so I'm bringing this to you uh, to help you. Amen? Matthew 19, 29 says, And everyone who has left houses or brothers, or sisters, father, or mother, wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. This isn't necessarily saying you're going to leave, physically leave them per se, but it's saying you're leaving, you're, you're setting your mind on him and the kingdom business above those. He comes above. There's scripture that talks about he actually turns us against one another because of the message of Christ. And it's not so much that we're against one another, but you see what I'm saying? It's the prioritizing. It's putting the kingdom, not your relationship, because that's there, that's existing. It's the kingdom. It's people. It's the people. It's people. If we were to get together a group of folks right now to go to Houston, how many people would we have go? So in my, my listening to the Holy Spirit about Lester Summerall's vision and his heart for people, and, you know, of course, he went through, so, he went to many nations. I can't even remember now. It was like 109, how many was it, Mom? Do you remember? 190 or so many nations. He was one of the first ones who started a uh, 24-7 radio station and, and TV station because um, he had a message to get to people. He had been given a commission to, from Christ, and he had to do it. He had to do it. He was burning. I remember we, my dad used to wear these little pins that said, win a million. And he said, we got to win a million for Jesus. we got to win a million for Jesus. Do you know that there's 22% of our nation is Islamic, and only 28.6 is Christian? 22 and 28.6, they're not that far behind, and they're rising we have to burn with this message, y'all. We've got to burn with what God's called us to do here on this earth. As I was meditating on that vision and just asking God, what is it you want us to do? I, uh, I text um, Lester Sumrall. His grandson is still living, obviously. He's, he was uh, a friend of ours being when we were raised around that area. And... Um, I was asking him about this vision just to clarify to make sure I delivered it correctly. And he said, he said, you know, Kim, I was actually thinking about you, you and your church, you guys' church last night. And I said, really? He said, yeah, I was praying about it. He said, I really feel that your church is going to be pivotal for the last days. And in this hour right now, even with the Houston thing, it's like God's wanting to do something. You guys have been kind of in hiding He's been protecting you and keeping you for such a time as this. And I, I, I said, you know, I, I had that in my spirit last week. And I thought, well, you know, you start to get moved by what you're seeing, what you're feeling. And the Holy Spirit arrested me and said, don't you be moved by what you see and what you feel anymore. I'm doing something. And you're hidden for a purpose for a time. 
And so in the meantime, what we've had to do when things have been, our church is wanting to flow with the Spirit and operate in the gifts and do what the original church did and not go with the funky, fandango, funny, silly stuff. Some do, and I'm not being ugly, but you know what I'm saying. There's all kinds of stuff that's going on in churches nowadays, and not all of it's bad. I'm not saying that. But uh, what I'm saying is we try to stay close to our heart with the direction of the Spirit. We try to stay close to allowing the gifts and allowing tongues and interpretation and speaking in the Spirit, you know, letting the fruit of your lips give thanks to God, those things. We're encouraging people to follow after God. And, and God said he's, he's, he's keeping us for this time. We've had to draw from the Spirit. We've had to draw from the Word when times have been hard, when seemingly we weren't moving forward. God said, seek me. Find, find answer in me. What do you do when times are hard? You get into the Word of God. You find out the way. You find out the truth. Jesus is the way. He is the truth. So in the midst of our, of our situations, we go to the Word and find out what He wants. So back to what he was saying. He said, I really believe your church is going to be used in this hour. Are you guys ready? Are you connected? And I thought, man, I don't know if we're ready. I don't know. Are we in position? Is everybody here in position, ready to do what God's called us to do if we had an influx of people right now? I do believe there's going to be some people coming into Austin. It's what happened to Katrina. Remember when Katrina happened, a whole bunch of folks moved into Austin. We need to be ready. We need to be prepared. But we can't do it by ourselves. We have to have your help. We have to have your commitment. We have to have your faithfulness. When we say, guys, let's get together and talk about in two weeks, back to church. We're going to have a meal afterwards. We're going to have food. We're going to try to make it fun and exciting for people so that they see we want them here. Because we, we do. We want them here. We want to give them an answer. But we've, we've got to, you know, when you go, are a fisher of men, you've got to put some bait on the end of the hook. You've got to get some people in. You can't go fishing without a worm on the end. I've tried, and it doesn't work. You've got to do something to draw the people in. And we know the Word says that it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. So let's give them some goodness while they're here. Let's give them a smile. Let's, let's give them an exhortation. Let's, you know, if you feel led to give money, give money. If you feel led to give a, a gift, give a gift. Whatever it is you feel led to. It's not all monetary, but sometimes God will move on your heart to do those things. And let me tell you what, it makes a difference sometimes in folks' lives. It opens up their heart to receive. I just looked up just for fun. You know, a lot of folks say I'm too busy. I have too many commitments. Let me just tell you what. This is, this is what we've been called to. This is our commission. This should be first. And I know our, our relationship with God is first, yes. But this is, a part, this is kingdom business, is people, souls. And if we're so occupied with our worlds and everything else that we're doing, we don't have time to give to God, then we're too busy. I looked up what, uh, what the statistics are on watching TV. Do you want to know it? You may not want to know it. <laughs> this was in 2014, so it may have changed. How many hours do we watch over time? Based on the figures, the average person watches 141 hours of TV per month. This isn't everybody, I know, but on the average. 1,692 hours per year. And assuming you reach the average U.S. life expectancy of 78, that's about 15 years of your life you'll be watching TV. And then they say the older you get, I guess because you get more still, not me either, you, you watch more. So, and then there's the DVR thing now. That's all a new thing. And then there's the phones. And then there's all this electronic stuff that just has us. You know, I'm, I'm trying to pull Braden away from it right now. He's got a tablet. And if he's not on the tablet, he's on my tablet. He drains that and he goes to the next one. Then he gets my phone and he's draining everything. And I'm like, you are on this way too much. It's an addiction. We, I know myself, I got to break away from it. You got to on purpose set things down and set time aside. You won't set time aside to be with God and to do these things unless you make it a priority. Because everything else, I promise you, everything else is going is to cry out and say, you ha don't have any time. You got to do this, 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 and this. I realize we have to live our lives. I'm not coming down on y'all. But I'm saying, is this a priority in your life? Are we making our commitment to Christ, to the kingdom, a, a, a priority in our lives? 
Or is everything else coming before it? I'm, I'm going to close here pretty soon, but I just want to read you a prophecy from Dad Hagen on the end times. How many believe in the prophets? The word says that you'll be blessed if you believe in the prophets. And not all people that say they're prophet are prophets. The self-proclaiming ones sometimes are not. <laughs> be careful. But I believe Brother Hagen was a prophet. I'm going to read this to you. It says, while I was conducting a revival in Rockwall, Texas, during the latter part of August and the first part of September, this is 1950. So how much further are we now? Almost 70 years. Is that right? I called the people around the altar for prayer at 10 p.m. As I was September 2nd. So we're here, September 3rd. As I was praying, the Spirit of the Lord came upon me in a wonderful way, and I began to pray in other tongues. In a few minutes, I heard a voice saying unto me, Come up hither. See, he wants us to come up. <laughs> I looked up and saw Jesus standing with a crown in his hands, and he said, This is a soul winner's crown. The crown was most beautiful, and human language could not even describe it. He said to me, My people are so careless and indifferent. This crown is for every one of my children. I speak and say, Go speak to this one. Go pray for that one. But my people are too busy. They put it off, and souls are lost because they will not obey me. I wept before him and repented of my failures, and then Jesus said to me, Come up hither again. And it seemed I went with him through the air till I saw a beautiful city. We did not go into the city, but beheld it at close range. How beautiful and indescribable it was. Jesus said, My people are so selfish. They say they're ready and talk about their mansion and their glories of heaven, while many all around them are in darkness and have no hope. Share your hope with them. Invite them to come with you. Then he had a vision of hell. He took me to hell. As I beheld it, I said, Lord, this looks like it did when I saw it on April 21st, 1933, because God healed him at 7.30 p.m. When I died and my soul went to this place, and you spoke, and my soul came back into my body. I then prayed through, and you saved me. God said, my, or Jesus said, my people are selfish. They're ready, and they talk about their mansion and the glories of heaven with many all around them in darkness and no hope. Only now, I'm not afraid or horrified as I was then. I saw what seemed to be human bodies wrapped in flames. And Jesus said to me, warn men and women about this place. And I cried out with tears that I would. And then he brought me back to earth, and he said, he stood by my side, and he talked to me about my ministry and told me some things in general that, that, he later explained in detail in another vision. Jesus disappeared, and I realized I was still kneeling on the platform, and I heard people crying and praying around me. Then there's the message of the horseman. About that time, the Holy Spirit came upon me again, and I fell flat on, the, on my face on the platform, and as I lay under the power, I saw a horseman riding at full speed towards me. He held a scroll of paper high in his left hand. I was not conscious of my earthly surroundings, but seemingly was in space somewhere. When the horseman came to me, he stopped, passed the scroll from his left hand to his right, and handed it to me, saying, Take and read. I opened or unrolled it and saw at the top of the page in big, bold, black print these words, War, Destruction. I was struck dumb and unable to speak. He laid his right hand on my head and said, Read in the name of Jesus. And I began to read what followed on the paper. Then I looked as the words instructed and, sa and saw what I had read about. I saw thousands and thousands of men in uniform marching to war. I saw many women, old, white-haired, middle-aged, middle, middle -aged, and even young, young women with babies in their arms, bowed together in sorrow and weeping profusely. I saw the skyline of a large city, and when I looked again, the skyscrapers were burned out holes. The city in ruins, there were written, there was written that not just one city would be destroyed, but many. Do you all know how, how seemingly possible this is right now? what he's prophesied. I saw the skyline of a large city, and when I looked again, the skyscrapers were burned out holes, the city in ruins. There were written that one city would be destroyed, but many. I read that already. I continued to read and scroll. It was written in the first person and was just like Jesus himself speaking. And he said, America is receiving her last call. Some nations have already received their last call and never will receive it again. And in capital letters, the time of end of all things is at hand. This was in the 50s. It was repeated at least four or five times. And he said also that this was the last great revival. This is the good part. 
I'm not here just to give you gloom and doom. <laughs> gifts to be restored to the church. All of the gifts of the Spirit will be in operation in the last days, and the church will do greater things than even the early church did and have greater power. Signs and wonders were written in the Acts of the Apostles. And he said, We have seen and experienced many healings, but would now behold amazing miracles such as had not been seen before. More and more miracles will be performed in the last days, which are just ahead. For he said, It is time for the gift of the working of miracles to be more in prominence. We now have entered into the era of miraculous, the miraculous. Many of my own people will not accept the moving of the Spirit and will turn back and will not be ready to meet me at my coming. Many will be deceived by false prophets and miracles of satanic origin. Just because they say they're coming to you in the name of Jesus doesn't mean they are. Make sure they're following after the truth of the word and there's no compromise. But follow the word of God and the spirit of God and follow me and you will not be deceived. I'm gathering my own together and preparing them for the time is short. There were several exhortations to be to watchfulness, to awake, to pray and not be deceived. And then the seven days before the flood. Then he said, as I was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of son, the son of man be. As I finally spoke to Noah and said, yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made I will destroy from the face of the earth. And today I'm speaking and giving America her last warning and a call to repentance and a time that is left it, that is comparable to the same last seven days of Noah's time. Many of our own people will not be accepting. They will not be accepting of the moving of my spirit and will turn back and will not be ready. Warn this generation, as did Noah, this generation for judgment is about to fall. He judges the righteous first. And these things will be fulfilled shortly, for I'm coming soon. He said again, this is the last revival, and I'm preparing my people for my coming. Judgment is coming, but I will call my people away, even unto myself, before the worst shall come. But thou shalt be faithful. Watch and pray were the concluding remarks. For the time of the end of all things is at hand. Matthew 24, 36 says, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be walking in a field. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what, the, your, what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what the hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. We are coming into a most significant time in the church, in church history. There is an acceleration and an overlapping of power that we're getting ready to see that's getting ready to be manifested. There's a company of people, that's us, and I know there's others, that have been hidden by God, and we will stand the challenge of all the powers of the enemy, just like Moses did when he stood before Egypt. God was with him, and he was able to uphold what God had called him to do. I believe that we are a part of that. I do believe that. And I believe that if we will step up to the plate, if we will take our position, what God's called us to do, if we will arise, wake up, and realize what he's called us to do for this hour that our time is short. What if Jesus came tomorrow? What if this was your last day? How would you live this day? We're the bride of Christ. When my daughter was getting ready to get married for a year, we were preparing. We were, we were buying things. We were preparing her. She was getting her body fixed because she had some issues going on. We were getting everything ready. Lots of preparation taking place for that wedding. And we are the bride of Christ. We are to be prepared. He's coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. And we need to be ready for his coming, for the, for the, the marriage supper. 
but I don't want to just go just me, myself, and I. I don't want all these people that we're witnessing to be lost and die and go to hell like Dr. Summerall saw. They're falling off. Do you know he saw specific um, nations and countries and peoples when he saw that vision? He saw people from India and Nepal and all kinds of places. And so when he started traveling, he was in Tibet, he saw people there that he saw and recognized in his vision. It was like a confirmation in his spirit because God had called him to do that, to, to tell people about Jesus, to tell about the love of Christ. And I know each and every one of us here, this is your heart, this is your, your passion because you've got God on the inside. It's the heartbeat of God is, is to share the gospel, the good news to others. We don't want our loved ones to be left behind. But we don't want anybody else to be left behind. It's easy for us to say, I don't want my you know, brother, sister, husband, father, whatever to be left behind, but we don't want anyone to perish. The Word says that He doesn't want anyone to perish. And so it's up to you. It's up to me. Say it's up to me. To go out, to win others to Christ, and to bring them in and make disciples. That's what... Pastor Steve and I are here for. That's what this church is here for. That's why our leaders are here. We're here not just to have church, not to sing some nice songs, not to get the Holy Ghost goosebumps, because all that's wonderful, and I love it, but we're here because we're here to bring the lost in and disciple them so they can go out and their lives can be changed and go out and bring some more. It's all about multiplicity. It's all about the kingdom. It's not just about you and your relationship. You know, I thought about, I thought about something um, pertaining to the church, the family of God. All of us here are a part of a family, right? I'm a mama. I have three kids, four with Brayden, and nothing thrills me more than to have my children. You know, at one time I had a couple of them in different cities. I still have, we still have Haley in one city. And, you know, Pastor Steve, his siblings are all over the world, Australia and all kinds of places. There's nothing more thrilling than for a family to come together. The parents, you, you're so excited when, you know, it's that love. But not only the love, it's the strength. It's the strength that you draw from. I remember when, when uh, Dad Bierman found out he had prostate cancer and we were all together one Christmas. He waited to tell us so we could come together and pray because there's that great strength that we have when we come together. Not out, out of obligation, but because it's necessary. It's who we are. What we do outside of here, ministry-wise, whatever, it's awesome, but there still is a need for us to come together as a body of Christ in this church, or whatever church people are called to, prayerfully if you're here, it's where you're called to be. And that's a whole other sermon. But you need to be where God's called you to be. And you need to be committed and do something where God's called you to be. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of our God. Let's be a blessing. Let's do our part. Let's fulfill the Great Commission. Amen. Everybody say, yes, I will. I will do it, Lord.